years ago in this quiet Auckland street, a young mother was beaten to death when she answered the door to a stranger. Her name was Tanya Ferlin, wife to Victor and mother of Katrina, Sonia and newborn Tiffany. Three months later, the police charged Christopher John Lewis with her murder, thanks largely to evidence supplied by his former friend and prison mate, Travis Burns, who was given a new life and $30,000 as a reward for his information. But then, two years later, Travis Burns committed an almost identical crime when he beat Joanne McCarthy to death with a hammer. Was it just coincidence that two young mothers should be murdered in the same way? And did the police properly investigate Travis Burns? I've been commissioned to investigate a series of unsolved and puzzling New Zealand crimes. Each of them chosen because of some larger issue of justice that affects all of us. Tonight's case raises some ethical issues that can occur right at the start of the process with the police inquiry. This is the document the police didn't want you to see. It's part of their own internal inquiry into whether their investigation into Tanya's homicide was good enough. It took seven months and the use of the Official Information Act to get it. I'll let you know what it says a bit later. For the moment, let's go back and remind ourselves of the facts of the case as we think we know them. Our top story, the mysterious death of a woman and the disappearance of her six-week-old baby in Auckland tonight. Police blocked off the entrance to this Howick Street after a woman was found unconscious in a pool of blood in her home. Like most New Zealanders, I first heard of Tanya's death on the news. The young mother of three had been beaten to death at the front door of her suburban home. It was an attack so vicious that the police thought her killer might be insane. Uh, this is an intense, savage attack by a person who the psychiatrist that I've spoken to indicate that there is likely to be some mental decomposition. The murder weapon was believed to have been a hammer. This is the type of weapon. This is an engineer's ball pen hammer. It's flat on one side, rounded on the other. The injuries caused to Tanya were caused by the rounded side. Initially, detectives thought Tanya had been murdered by a deranged woman, perhaps a patient in the hospital where Tanya had given birth just six weeks before. But those inquiries led nowhere. Then after three months of slow progress, a breakthrough. A member of the public walks into an Auckland police station with information that leads to the arrest of Christopher Lewis. At least that's the way 60 Minutes told it. The breakthrough in the investigation came at 13 weeks. A man walked into the Otahuhu police station saying Chris Lewis had boasted to him that he'd killed Tanya Furlan. The trouble is, that's not the way it happened. It wasn't any well-meaning citizen that dobbed in Christopher Lewis but his former cellmate, Travis Burns. Burns, a convicted thief and rapist, was back in Mount Eden jail having breached his parole. The following reconstruction is based on his statement about what Lewis is supposed to have told him. As you know, in May of this year, I was given six months parole and sent to the Waipareva Trust Rehabilitation Centre in Massey. I knew Chris Lewis from prison. I remember he turned up one day, out of the blue. We went to the back of the office area and he started whispering to me. Did you hear about that, uh, that Furlan chick that got murdered, some mad bitch stole her baby? Yeah. That mad bitch was me, bro. What? Shh. True, bro, true, true, true. So why'd you do it? I needed money, man. I want a couple of thousand bucks on the dojo. Thought I'd grab this chick and get her old man to pay. Her husband's the uh, manager of the Big Fresh out of Glendowie. Yeah. The amount of money they make on a Friday night, man. 
Thought he'd be able to pay, no problem. Well, so, what'd you do? Well, go up to the house with this cardboard box, right? Yeah. Like I got a delivery. Hi, I've got a uh, delivery for Victor Furlan. So, oh, can I get a pen for the signature? I've lost mine. You haven't got a pen, I could borrow it. Just grab one. Thanks. She goes and gets a pen. When she comes back, I'm ready for it. <laughs> she starts fucking screaming, man, thrashing about. Get her down on the ground. I thought I'd tie her up, shut her up. She's thrashing about, so I just uh, grabbed this hammer that I bought with me. What kind of hammer? Oh, it's one of those engineer's hammers, you know. What, what are they oh, called with the, uh, the ball pen? Yeah, fucking ball pen, bro. Just shut her! <laughs> I fucking hit her too hard, man. And there's Jesus. blood pissing out everywhere. So I knew I totally fucked it up. Yeah. So I, uh, I just like hit her four or five more times, you know, just to, just to finish it off. According to Burns, Lewis said that because the kidnap plan had gone wrong, he took the baby instead. Go on, I grab the baby that's there, I fucking stick it in the cardboard box and chuck a ransom note on the ground, get the fuck out. And what'd you do then? Oh. So I'm driving around, got this fucking kid in the car, right? Yeah. Just thinking this is getting just way too hot, man. So I dumped the baby outside this church. Best thing I could have ever fucking done. Throws the pigs right off the trail. Did he say what car he used? His girlfriend's Tridia. Without Byrne's statement, it's unlikely that Lewis would ever have been a suspect. But once they had his name, it all seemed to fit. Because Lewis was known to them as a very dangerous man. At 17, he'd been arrested for arson and using a shotgun to rob a post office near his school. That same year, he tried to assassinate the Queen during her visit to Dunedin, for which he was committed to Lake Alice Psychiatric Hospital. Four years later, he was the subject of a national manhunt when he escaped from police custody. And just two weeks after Tanya's murder, he was caught on camera robbing a bank in Auckland. So when Travis Burns pointed the police in the direction of Christopher Lewis, they immediately traced him to his parents' house in Christchurch, where they found him wearing a pair of shoes, the soles of which matched the shoe prints taken from the scene of the crime. It was enough evidence to arrest Lewis and charge him with Tanya's murder. The murder of Tanya Ferlin is the tale of two killers, the psychotic Christopher Lewis and career criminal Travis Burns, who informed on Lewis and was later given $30,000 in a deal that was kept secret from the New Zealand public. But putting the morality of all of that to one side for a moment, just how reliable was his statement, given that Burns was a convicted thief and rapist who was still serving time in Mount Eden Jail when he put his signature to this document? So let's just go through some of the things that he said. The first thing Burns helped the police with was the motive. He says that Lewis told him he'd gone to Bampton Rise that afternoon not to take the baby, but to kidnap Tanya. He says that Lewis told him that he'd killed her, that he'd wanted to kidnap her to get the money from Big Fresh in Glenfield, because he knew the manager lived in this house. And of course, the plan to get the Friday night takings tied in quite nicely with this. Evidence of a ransom note found in Lewis's flat. From indentations on a page of that notebook, the police recovered the words written in Lewis's own hand. If you followed, you never see wife. Come alone, she die. When get money, you will get wife. 36 hours later, no ring pigs. OK, well, Burns goes on to state that Lewis told him how he got into the house posing as a delivery man. Hi, I've got a uh, delivery for Victor Furlan. He had a hammer and a cardboard box. And when he got inside the house, he asked for a pen. You haven't got a pen, I could borrow it. Sure, I'll just grab one. Thanks. She went away for a pen and then came back, and that's when it happened. <laughs> then he says, that Lewis put the baby in the same cardboard box. 
Okay, well, here's the thing that puzzles me. If the intention's to kidnap Tanya and not the baby, then why does Lewis turn up with such a big box to hide such a small hammer? And it has to be a big box, doesn't it? Because Burns says that Lewis told him he put the baby in it. It's odd, isn't it? Odder still is what Burns says that Lewis does with the ransom note. He said he left it by Tanya's body, but then came back to it and got it half an hour later when he realised it was useless. Now, Lewis is a career criminal. He knows the less time you spend at a crime scene, the more chance there is of success. Would he really risk coming back to the Ferlin house just for the note? And here's another curious thing. Burns says Lewis told him that he'd used a ball-peen hammer. Now that's a very precise description. Wouldn't Lewis have just said he used a hammer? Why specifically use the words ball-peen? Or could it be that Burns had seen the Crime Watch program of a couple of weeks before, when Detective Inspector John Manning used those very words to describe what he thought might be the murder weapon? This is the type of weapon that we believe is likely to have been used. This is a engineer's ball pen hammer. It's flat on one side, rounded on the other. Well, OK. Let's imagine kidnapping was the motive. Isn't that a crime that's usually committed by more than one person? One person to handle the victim, the other to drive the car? Of course, Lewis might have been able to do it if he'd tied Tanya up. And that, of course, is what Burns said happened. But there's no forensic evidence to show that Tanya was ever tied up. So what are we to believe about what Burns said? Certainly one piece of evidence did seem to put Lewis at the scene of the crime. A shoe print from a unique pair of running shoes, which he owned. It was perhaps the strongest link that the police had connecting Lewis to Tanya's murder as one of the detectives explained on a 60 Minutes programme. That one's from the scene, and that's uh, Lewis's right shoe. The forensic scientist who did the work on that shoe print has agreed to talk to me. He's in private practice now, but he used to work here at the ESR. His name's Marnix Kelderman. Marnix, tell me about the crime scene. Well, initially we could see uh, that there were some bloodied shoe prints on the floor. So we had a look at the shoe prints and we knew that there were police and ambulance officers in attendance. We requested all their shoes. Uh, we could identify which ones had blood and we could compare them straight away with the shoe prints in blood which were on the various floor tiles. Now Mrs Ferlin had cleaned the tiles that morning and that helped you, didn't it? Yes, it did. We later found out that she was a very meticulous person and she cleaned the tiled floors in the whole house every day. So we knew we were dealing with just the shoe prints on that day. Tanya had mopped the foyer in the late morning, and a couple of hours later, a friend popped in for a cup of tea and a chat. <laughs> then sometime between 4.30 and 4.45, Lewis came to the door with his bogus delivery. <laughs> All the other shoe prints came from the ambulance and police staff attending the scene. We went through every single tile, because every single one was photographed, and compared to all the shoes that we were aware of had been present that day, we eliminated the whole lot, except for one. There was one shoe print we couldn't eliminate, and that was a Reebok Ashcrack, uh, size 11 half 12. It turned out that this print matched a shoe that Lewis was wearing on the day that he was arrested. When you compare the two shoes, you go for a number of features. So effectively, like here, we have seven marks, and by comparing it, you could say, what is the chance you're gonna get that mark in exactly that space with exactly that shape on this size shoe in New Zealand? It's as clear as a bell. So on the evidence of the shoe prints, the police concluded that Lewis, and only Lewis, had committed Tanya's murder. That foot, that's the right foot planted. And blows to the back of the head, I think. Certainly on the face of it, the shoe print does seem to put Lewis at the scene of the crime. 
The only trouble is, he had an alibi which would have made it very difficult for him to be there. He said he was taking his girlfriend to yoga and picking her son up from school. And his girlfriend, whose real name I can't tell you because she still has name suppression, gave the police a statement verifying that what Lewis had said was true. Did he pick you up from yoga every Friday? Every Friday. What about Friday the 26th of July? Yes. In a book he wrote in prison, Lewis further claimed that he was set up for Tanya's murder by her real killer, who he called Jimmy the Weasel, but whose real name was Travis Burns. Now, I don't buy into that claim, but it's important because this is where the saga all begins. And the truth of it may well have been resolved at Lewis's trial. But we'll never know, for behind the walls of Mount Eden, Lewis's mind was deteriorating. In the early hours of the 23rd of September, 1997, he shaved his head and wrote a suicide note. I have not done any of these crimes. I am looking forward to peace of mind. I am tired of feeling no joy, the pain and disappointment. One day you will understand. With all my love for you, Chris. Moments later, he ended his life. With Lewis dead, there could be no trial, so the question of who killed Tanya Ferlin was shifted from the High Court to the Coroner's Court, which on the 27th of November, 1997, found that Christopher Lewis had acted on his own when he murdered Tanya Ferlin. Now, I don't have any great sympathy for Christopher Lewis, but I do have to say that the fact that the Crown was allowed to present its argument that he'd murdered Tanya Ferlin when Lewis wasn't represented by counsel is, in my view, simply unfair. That's the way it was. And in the same month, Burns was paid $30,000 for his help, and the case was closed. Or so everyone thought, until a year later, Travis Burns walked into a suburban home in Whangaparoa and hammered a young mother to death. Travis Burns murdered Joanne McCarthy in front of two toddlers and then made sure she was dead by drowning her in her own bath. It was immediately apparent to detectives that Joanne McCarthy had done her best to fight off her attacker. At her autopsy, they discovered she scratched her killer collecting his DNA under the fingernails of her left hand. And when the forensic scientists checked their database of known offenders, they found it matched a sample they had from a convicted rapist, Travis Burns. I mean, is this, is this sort of DNA stuff checked and double checked and triple checked and all that sort of thing? I'm satisfied that it's your DNA yeah. on the advice that's been taken, I've taken from the experts involved. So what does this mean? You're going to arrest me? You have to. Yeah, you'll be arrested, Travis. So now we seem to have two killers. Lewis, who said he was dobbed in by Burns for hammering a young mother to death. And Burns, the informant, who did exactly the same crime a year later. Small wonder the police felt under some obligation to re-examine the way they had conducted the Fernan investigation. Which is why Detective Superintendent Nick Perry ended up writing this, his internal review of the investigation into the Ferlin homicide. But before we get to that, let's take our own look at what Christopher Lewis said happened. The unique footprints left by a pair of Reebok shoes was arguably the strongest piece of Crown evidence that put Christopher Lewis at the scene of the crime. Without a doubt, they were made by the shoes that Lewis was wearing on the day that he was arrested. But a shoe print 
is not a fingerprint. In his book, Lewis claims that he was set up by Travis Burns, who stole his shoes and wore them to the murder scene. It was only after he was arrested, he said, that he realised this must have been what happened. Yeah, right. But let's imagine for a moment that Burns does steal Lewis's shoes. He's living in a halfway house run by the Waiparera Trust. It's a way out here on Highway 16. It's 40 kilometres from the Ferland home. How could he get to the scene of the crime? Well, Lewis has an answer to that in his book too. He said he lent Burns his little red Daihatsu so he could go out and look after their marijuana plot. Burns, however, denied he'd borrowed the car. At Lewis's deposition hearing, he said he'd only moved it once and as a favour. This is what he said. Question, you picked the Daihatsu up from Douglas Road? Answer, yes. Where did you drive it? Answer, back to the rehabilitation centre. Apart from that occasion, how many other times did you drive the car? Burns says, just that once. But I don't believe that either. But it's interesting that Burns admits that A, he could get away from the halfway house to travel 40 kilometres or so to the other side of Auckland, and B, that he admits that he at least had access to Lewis's little red Daihatsu. Because when I was looking through some old Crime Watch programmes, I found this. Home. It's a drive that would have taken about 20 to 30 minutes. Shortly before little Tiffany was found, a car was seen driving out of this parking area. It was a red three-door Japanese hatchback similar to this that turned left into Simon Street and headed towards the roundabout. It's important that police find the driver of that car. One thing we do know is that the driver of the red Japanese car couldn't have been Christopher Lewis. Because everyone agrees, he was driving his girlfriend's Mitsubishi Tredia that day. I can't wait. Right. See you later. Bye. But could the driver of that red Japanese car that the Crime Watch program asked about have been Travis Burns in the red Daihatsu that he borrowed from Christopher Lewis? Well, one man who might be able to shed some light on that is lawyer David Jones. He was going to defend Lewis at trial. I understand you were going to present some evidence in court that it couldn't have been Christopher Lewis that dropped the baby off. That's correct. We had two witnesses who'd been interviewed by the police uh, and we'd re-interviewed them and subpoenaed them to come to court to give evidence that uh, a person had been seen in the very area where the baby had been found um, doing something in the garden and the description of that person was completely opposite to that of Mr Lewis. What was the description? A dark-skinned person um, who was quite tall, as I recall, athletic, uh, and um, uh, appeared to have quite um, muscled legs. The, the witness said they could actually see the muscles through the jeans. Travis Burns is a tall, athletic, dark-skinned man. But internal job sheets reveal the police believed it wasn't him, and that the two Polynesian witnesses had mistaken a Pākehā member of the church for a tall Māori. So if it had gone to trial, the jury would have had to have considered the conflicting evidence that it might have been someone who looked like Travis Burns who left the baby at the church. In his book, Christopher Lewis says he met Travis Burns while he was serving time in Paramarima Prison. And for a time, they were good friends. Lewis was released in 1995, and about a year later, Burns got parole. Which is when, Lewis says, Travis Burns came to see him with a kidnapping plan. You uh, interested in doing a job? Like what? Kidnapping. <laughs> Fucking kidnapping. Are you crazy, man? There's never been a successful kidnapping in New Zealand. Oh, come on. But according to Lewis, he says he told Burns that he was going straight, and he just wasn't interested. And later, he says, he remembered Burns ripping out a page of something 
that could have been a ransom note. Did that conversation ever take place? If it did, it's hard for me to imagine that Lewis ever said to Burns that he wasn't interested in kidnapping. Because the police collected a lot of anecdotal evidence suggesting completely the opposite. You see, Christopher Lewis believed he was a ninja. He imagined he was a martial arts expert, and in an industrial shed in Glenfield, he started his own dojo for other wannabe ninjas. He fantasized about having his own private army of ninjas, and some of his recruits testified that they'd attended a weekend camp where he taught them how to crawl through the grass, undetected. Okay, grab one of these. He also taught them how to tie people up. All part of his bizarre plan to rob a bank on Waiheke Island. Right. If you have any trouble, you sort them out. Come on, faster. That's it, move it. Get it in the water. OK. This is the place where Christopher Lewis had his dojo. By all accounts, it was a pretty sad little gym. And exponents of the ninja arts, well, they tell me it was a bit of a joke, really. But that didn't stop Lewis getting his followers. And one night after class, a guy called Andrew Collett had a conversation with Christopher Lewis and gave a statement to the police. You know, Andy, we need money to make this dojo really work. Yeah. I was thinking we could do some missions. Like what? What about a kidnapping? I know this guy, he's, he's got heaps of money, but... Take his grandson, he'd pay up for sure. What that conversation tells us is that Lewis knew that it took at least two people to do a kidnapping. One to drive the car, and the other to handle the victim. So I wonder, if Lewis recruited his old mate Travis Burns to help him out. Now initially it didn't seem that Burns could be involved because one, no forensic evidence puts him at the scene of the crime, and two, he seemed to have a perfect alibi. You see, the day that Tanya Ferlin was murdered, Burns was on parole and living away out here at the end of Highway 16 in a halfway house run by the Waipareira Trust. According to official timesheets, Burns had been signed off by a guard as being present at the house at 4.45 on the afternoon that Tanya was murdered and therefore couldn't have been at the crime scene. But, and now we come to it, the police internal review. It reveals that after Burns was arrested for murdering Joanne McCarthy, a second police team, led by Detective Superintendent Perry, found that there was, and I quote, an inconsistency in respect of Burns' alleged alibi. It turns out that the supervisor who signed Burns as being present didn't always fill in the timesheets with the inmate standing right in front of him. And because he'd seen Burns earlier that afternoon, he just ticked him off as being present at 4.45. Friday, July 26. It was only when the second inquiry team asked him to verify Burns' times that the error came to light. So Burns no longer has an alibi. But if he was involved in Tanya's murder, how did he get from the trust house all the way to the Ferlin house? Well, by car. Burns admitted at depositions that he was able to leave the rehabilitation house and that he had access to Lewis's little red Daihatsu. So in September of 1999, the police decided to time the journey from the trust house to the Ferlin home. Now, the last time anyone actually remembered seeing Burns at the trust was before four o'clock. So giving him the benefit of the doubt, the police set out to do their journey precisely at 4 p.m. The detectives who did the test drive in 1999 said that the motorway traffic was medium to heavy with traffic being slowed at one point because of an accident. Still, they reported, they arrived at Bampton Rise at 4.40. 
which was within the time frame. So, how am I doing? 11 years and a lot more traffic later. 4.39. And we know that Tanya died somewhere between 4.30 and 5 o'clock, so it's possible Burns could have got here in time. Then dropped baby Tiffany off at the Baptist Church before heading back to the Waipareira Trust where he's seen between 7 and 8 o'clock. It's possible. But that doesn't help Christopher Lewis because, believe it or not, the second inquiry team also discovered that he didn't have the alibi that he claimed to have either. A check of Lewis's phone records revealed that he was actually calling his girlfriend at the very time he said he was with her. Confronted by this evidence, Lewis's former girlfriend changed her statement. Your phone. Shit. I remember. He was late that night. So, Lewis doesn't have an alibi, and his shoe print is at the scene of the crime. He's talked to several people about kidnapping, and he's written a ransom note. So in my book, no question, he's definitely guilty. But what about Travis Burns? Well, again, no alibi. And he has access to Lewis's red Daihatsu car. And here's a curious thing. This is a copy of the blood test done by the ESR. It reveals that Tania's blood was on the carry cot that baby Tiffany was found in at the church. So that means that the baby was handled by someone who was in the hallway where Tanya died, right? And remember Burns reporting Lewis as saying that blood was pissing out everywhere? Well, the strange thing is that when they tested Lewis's Mitsubishi, the car that everyone agrees Lewis was driving that day, they don't find any blood. But when they luminol test the red Daihatsu, which Lewis said he'd lent Burns, guess what? They get a positive reaction on the passenger seat and in the footwell to what might be blood. It's not conclusive, I know. There are no forensics to put Burns at the scene of the crime either. But I am curious about this. It's a photograph of the hallway where Tanya died. And if you look closely at it, you'll see that the doormat's been moved. Now, Lewis's shoe prints were made in soil, not blood. So the police concluded that Lewis moved the mat so that he could avoid stepping into the blood when he came back with the ransom note. But could it be that it was a second person, someone helping Lewis who moved the mat so that he could stand on it and avoid leaving his footprints on the tiles? I'm not saying that Burns was definitely involved, but in my opinion, there were reasonable grounds to reinvestigate him. It was also the opinion Detective Superintendent Perry gave in his internal review. The document that took the police seven months to release to me under the Official Information Act. And here's what Detective Perry recommends. One, that the murder investigation of Tanya Fern be recommenced. Two, that this investigation focus on Travis Burns as a suspect involved in the murder of Tanya Furman. So, have the police acted on their own recommendation? Have they reinvestigated Travis Burns? And if not, why not? It's time we put some of these questions to the police. The question of whether Travis Burns assisted Christopher Lewis in the murder of Tanya Ferlin has led me to Police National Headquarters and Crime Manager, Detective Superintendent Wynne Vanderveld. What efforts were made to check the veracity of what Travis Burns said? Because Travis Burns brings with him a, a criminal history, for him to be a credible witness, the interrogation of what he was saying, um, knowing that he would be a witness in court, was thorough. You say good, competent, yep. hard-working detectives, yep. all of them, didn't check Christopher Lewis's telephone records? No. Is that good enough? Uh, I mean, the, the bottom line is, in hindsight, yeah, no, it doesn't look good. At the time of the investigation, at best, an oversight. Um, didn't check Travis Burns's alibi. 
Well, see, I, I disagree with that. They did check Travis Burns' alibi. The information that they were given, they, they used as the foundation to base what, what they acted on. It was only afterwards when, when it was clearly interrogated and there was further information that indicated it may not have been as, as accurate as, as originally tabled that raised the, the suspicion identified by, by Superintendent Perry. OK, so Burns says that um, Lewis told him he tied up Tanya Fallon. It's in his statement. But yet there's no forensic evidence that uh, Tanya was ever tied up and indeed when her body was found, it wasn't tied up. Did the officers ever ask Travis Burns uh, about that area? No, but, uh, I can't answer your question. I, I don't know the answer to that. But, but you, might, you might have expected that they might have. For sure. You know, he, he's, he said, she's tied up. And, and, and would you have expected your officers to go back and say, well, hang on, Travis, um, you know, there's a couple of things here. If this is what Burns has been told by Lewis, then he can only repeat what he's been told by Lewis. Um, he can't elaborate on it if he doesn't know the, the details of the facts other than what he's been told. Everyone agrees that Christopher Lewis was driving the Mitsubishi Tredia that day. Yes. It's in, it's in Burns' statement. Yes. There is blood, isn't there, on the cocoon? That's correct. And possibly the baby clothes? But what that indicates, isn't it, whoever killed Tanya handled the cocoon? Yes. I mean, that's pretty, that, yes, seems, pretty, that, that, yes. that seems pretty Transfer good. of blood, yes. Right, transfer of blood. Burns says that Lewis said to him that blood was pissing out everywhere. Yes. That's what he says in the, in, in the statement. Yet there is no blood found in the Mitsubishi, in the car that everybody says that Christopher Lewis was driving. If there's blood everywhere, if there's blood on the cocoon, you'd expect some blood in the car. Now, there may or may not be, but you would expect the warning bells to go off. Hello, Burns has said, mm. there's blood everywhere. No blood in the car. wonder how much truth is to this thing here. But, but the first thing that would come to mind in relation to that is the question, and, and I don't know the answer to it, but is there the possibility that a vehicle other than the vehicle used by Christopher Lewis was used, which would account for why there was no blood in that particular car? In other words, if this was a planned intention for, for kidnapping or extortion, then he's actually stolen a car to commit that crime. I, at some stage during that day, he drove that car because he picks his girlfriend up on it. It's established that he's driving the, the Mitsubishi. So you're satisfied that Travis Burns was not involved in the murder of Tanya Fallon? I am satisfied that there is no evidence to date that connects Travis Burns with the Tanya Fallon homicide. At what stage did you decide to pay $30,000 to Travis Burns? Well, I can indicate to you that that was paid to him in November of 1997. So it was paid to him 12 months uh, after he first came to police. Uh, it was paid to him after he had given uh, evidence at the depositions hearing of Lewis. And it was given after uh, Lewis had committed suicide. Um, and so there was no further evidential role uh, in relation to this for Travis Burns. Was money discussed at the time that he gave his statement? My understanding is no, it wasn't. Uh, money never, never got mentioned in relation to this throughout the inquiry until after uh, all matters had been concluded. What other assistance was he given? Uh, well, he certainly was put on to a, um, a witness protection program um, prior to him giving evidence and, and being dealt with in relation to um, the giving of evidence against Lewis. But was he found a place to live? Yes. On Whangaparoa Peninsula? some 20 odd minutes driving distance uh, from the location of the McCarthy home, yes. We know that Travis Burns is a violent man, was a violent man at the time. He'd, he'd, he'd served time for violent crimes. Rape, aggravated robbery. Was he at ever at any stage considered to be a threat to the public? He had served his criminal sentences um, for the, for the crimes that he'd committed. When he came forwards in relation to this, it went completely against the codes that he had lived by. To give evidence against a fellow colleague, for want of a better term, was completely against his, his code. From those that dealt with Burns, who I've spoken to, they actually saw this as the turning point in Burns' life, um, an opportunity for him to change his ways and, and basically put the past behind him and move forward. None more so than those people 
uh, were shattered um, by the subsequent homicide. And do you still pay uh, convicted criminals um, large amounts of money to inform on others? Yes. Why? Where we've got situations where, where there's, there's no other evidence available or where we can intercede in organised criminal activity, for instance, um, then that information to, to bring crime to a, a close or, or, or to be able to intercede on crime um, is valuable information. And, and to that end, I mean, there's a number of motivators for why people come forwards, but certainly financial gain is one of them. But I, you would also agree that the kind of people we're talking about, there are people who would say anything you like for $30,000. What, what you're inferring here is, is did Travis Burns get paid thirty thousand dollars for false testimony? And again, all I can say is, is Travis Burns' um, statement and the evidence that he offered was open to scrutiny both by police and by by defence counsel and the court through the deposition hearing. That all took place before any money was put on the table. So, what have you learned out of this inquiry? Uh, I guess the detailed interrogation of, of um, alibi um, evidence um, was something that was learnt. The degree of blood uh, from, from a scene such as this one um, were lessons that were learned. So, so there were a, a number of lessons learned as a result of that inquiry. But payment to criminals to inform on other criminals is something that you are quite comfortable with. Uh, unfortunately, well, I mean, the bottom line is yes, I am. Um, I mean, it should be identified that, that um, post this inquiry, um, and, and I'm just looking at the date, in 2002, um, the police, together with the Ministry of Justice and Crown Law, sat down and looked at the whole issue around um, the issuing of rewards for information around homicides um, and the payment um, to people um, for that reward information or for information that leads to the apprehension. Were defence lawyers invited to that conversation? Uh, in this particular case, no, they weren't. Oh. But, but having said that, there were a number of, again, recommendations that were highlighted from it. Um, it needs to be identified that sometimes we have to work with the criminal element to actually solve cases. Um, if we don't, they remain unsolved. And, and I think in, in the case of... of uh, families of victims, the, the thought that we compensate offenders but are able to identify who the offender is that's been involved in the crime um, is, is an, an acceptable one. Um, for, for the juries and for the veracity of what's being tabled, that's for the court to decide. So, who killed Tanya Fallon? Well, Christopher Lewis, definitely. But was Travis Burns involved? I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because, in my opinion, both Burns' alibi and his statement were far too readily accepted at the time of the inquiry. And while the police say they've learned lessons from their investigation into Tanya's death, I do wonder how much they've learned from the murder of Joanne McCarthy. Because, frankly, if the police still think it was OK to pay a large amount of money to a man who was convicted of aggravated robbery, home invasion and rape, and to give him a completely new identity so that he was free to collect a benefit and get a new passport and a driving licence, if they can't see that to give all of that to Travis Burns was wrong, then I think we have a genuine reason to be concerned for our safety. For if paying criminals to inform is still the official police policy, then how do we know that they have not secretly assisted some other Travis Burns to live amongst us?